and uh, and so let me pray. So Lord, we uh, lift up Brother Tom. We lift up the word that is on his heart. We thank you, God, for the words that are coming forth here in recent weeks, especially uh, with regard to your tabernacle and how they parallel with uh, various aspects of uh, time frame and the ages and the future and and ourselves. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this continuation of this series. And uh, Lord, I see it also as an expression of the body of Christ as we go from one to the other and how God has revealed these various truths one to the other. And every joint is supplying and every block in this tabernacle this temple that you are building is fitting uh, perfectly together. And we thank you for that, Lord. So God, give us ears to hear tonight. Give an anointing upon our brother Tom to express clearly what you've shown to him and what is on his heart. And Lord, may uh, we be able to understand it. And then may you show us what we are to do with it to uh, to show it to others, to teach it to others, and to express it to others in how you have revealed it to us, Lord. Uh, this is the most exciting time to be alive, and there's so much uh, great things before us, Lord. And God, we know that you are preparing a people for this last time, this, these end days, and we give you glory and praise for the privilege of being a part of it. Lord, we don't want to miss the mark in any way. We don't want to be disqualified in any way. But Lord, we press into you with everything within our hearts and within our souls, Lord. We press into you deeper. And we thank you, God, for this. Bless our time now, we pray. And we do pray again for David and Glenn, not only for their time with Glenn's dad tonight, but as they begin to travel from Las Vegas all the way to New York. We just protect them as they drive every day, every step of the way, every mile, Lord, and may they have blessed fellowship together, we pray. And we give you glory and praise now in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Amen. <laughs> Greetings. Hallelujah. Um, it has been interesting these last few weeks. There's been a kind of continue a building upon each message. And uh, when Gary was ministering last, was, it, uh, was that a Sunday, Gary? Can't even remember what day it was on. When you were talking about the yeah, tabernacle. Sunday, Sunday, a week and a half ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he had mentioned something. <laughs> um, he, he had shown a chart of the ages. And I don't know if you have that chart available there, Gary. And, but he had a chart of the ages. I and then, that, then he superimposed, he said, the seven days fit in there somewhere, but that's for later teaching. And uh, I kind of chuckled because as he said that, the Lord began to show me some things with these days. It's something I've always been um, interested in. I've, I've looked at that, but something he said quickened me and I looked it up and I just, I was amazed by what I saw. And I will get to that specific day when, when that happened down the line, but um, that's where I wanted to. So I want to talk about the seven days of creation and line it up with what's happened um, over the last 7,000 or 6,000 years right now, uh, dealing with that. Thanks, Gary. That should be just, we see the seven days in that time frame. Um, so let's, I just want to start with Genesis. Let's we'll start with the day one at the beginning and Genesis one, uh, verses two through five states, let me go back here. <clears throat> The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and darkness he called night, in the evening and the morning for the first day. We see in the first thousand years, it basically takes us from Adam to Noah. Adam was born, you know, in these days I'm going to use, um, you're going to see a little bit different, some of them than what Gary had up here, but these are this idea with that. Dates, there's no definitive dates in scripture, 
but there's very um, you can direct some things pretty pretty uh, close. Uh, the dates that I use are basically strictly from the scriptures. Uh, you graph it out, and this is what it says. So, um, you know, if they live so many years, you just graph out that many years. Somebody else is born this far into that life, you you graph it out like that. So it's pretty um, a simple way of looking at that. If there are gaps, if there are other things, you leave the gaps. You don't try to squeeze it, make them fit, but you try to work within that. And you find that there's really not a lot of gaps or there's there or in there's, but that's again, that's for another day also. But it started off, we started off in creation at 4004 BC. Um, that's when Adam was created. We do find out a bit by all that, if you do that graph out of Genesis, uh, Adam Noah was born in around the year 2948. Okay, so right around 3,000. The first 1,000 years, I have done between Adam and Noah. And it's interesting. It says, he divided the light from darkness. Now, if you go to Genesis 6, verse 5. Well, the other thing I want to say is, I've got this. It's an incomplete study. And what I mean by that, I, I really didn't feel to go into deep details. A few areas I'm going to drill down, but I wanted to share this. And uh, after it's over, I'd like to really leave it open. Is, is God speaking something to you in the midst of that? And I believe um, some of this stuff is going to be very interesting and in seeing it from each of your viewpoints. So um, I look for as much feedback if you'd like to give at that time. Anyway, going back to Genesis 6, verse 5. And said, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Verse 5. And it talks about these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. So we see a very best, there's a lot of witnesses, light and darkness is being split. Okay, there's a righteous generation. But wickedness is throughout the whole world. Great, it, how does it say? It is great in the earth. The wickedness of man is great in the earth. So you're finding that hasn't, but God had a righteous line. And we see that with Noah. And I want to point out something else at this point. It says Noah was perfect in his generation. Brother, we need to understand really what perfection is in one of the, and perfected is that you fulfill what God has called you to your generation. We talked about in the tabernacle all the different, um, you know, the uh, different stages. We line that up with the seals and the, um, the seals, the trumpets, the vials of, of revelation, um, all these things. It's interesting. We live in different, as Gary showed, that different dip dispensations. So Noah was faithful or was perfect in his generation, in the era that God had placed him. And that's what we, each of us, need to be faithful to the generation that God has put us in. It said in, in Acts 13, it says, David served his generation by the will of God. David was there just to serve his generation. We are there to serve a generation. We're going to be responsible for what God is doing today. We can't live on yesterday's manna. We can't live on what happened in previous times. We have to live in what God is speaking today. So, the, so I mean, we want to understand Noah. Noah was perfect in his generation for what God had called him to be in that hour. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Amen? Amen. So I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's so important because sometimes why don't ever measure up? You're not there to measure up to anybody. You're there to be perfect in the generation that God has called you to. And what it means by perfect is that you fulfill the end view of God's purposes. You do what he did. Noah did it but by building the ark. He fulfilled what God had called him to do. And in that sense, he was perfect. Just like you may have a 1999 Chevy that's, you know, considered an antique. But if it gets you from point A to point B, it was perfect. It got you to where you were going. And we have to look at things in that regard. Do we do what God has called us to do? And that's why it's so important for Dwayne, no matter what background he has, where he's been, and things he may seem failed. If he could fulfill what God has called him to do with this additional extent of his life, he will be perfect. You understand what I mean by that, Russell? He needs to know that he has a hope before him by the calling that God has on his life. And that each of us needs to fulfill that and walk in that path. Wherever you've been, you know what I'm saying? 
All things, you know, are behind you, okay? Behold, all things are new. The past is behind you. But we can be perfect in what God has called in us today. And he's calling the people. To, I believe the sixth seal has been opened. We need to be people of this generation doing what God has called us in this hour, in the mystery that's being revealed by the seal that was opened and the trumpet that will sound. Amen. Side note. So you find out Adam to Noah. We see great witness. Okay, knew that. He called the light good. <laughs> he said, and I thought that was really interesting. On that regard, it said there was, he divided the light and the darkness, but the light was good. I'm sorry. God, yeah. God did the right life. So this is the place, there's a division. Now we're going to find something else interesting in here. There's a man that is called Enoch. You know, Enoch lived 300 years. He's walked with God and he was no more. Okay? That's an interesting aspect on it. He was a perfect man. God pulled out the perfect man, the man of that hour, the man that walked with him. And yet that man had a son, and his name was Methuselah. And it's interesting. Before God took Enoch out, he gave him a son on this earth named Methuselah. And what Methuselah was, was a clock. That's the first clock that I see that God has put in Scripture. Okay, because Methuselah, his name alone means, when he dies, it shall come. And we will find out that the year that Methuselah died was the year that the flood came. Very interesting. A clock was put in place. So in this first generation, the clock was set. Or the first thousand years, the first day one, the clock was set for day two. Amen. So moving on, let's go on to day two. Oh, excuse me. I do have one more scripture here for, me for day one. And that's well, it's another one about Noah. Verse 7, 1, it says, the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for I have seen righteous before me in this generation. So light, the division between light and darkness. And that's what we see in day one. And we see what that light and darkness was. Is a, righteous, a righteous line was being established. And the second day, we find it's a very interesting day also. And that's verses 6 through 8 of Genesis 1. And it says, God said, let there be a firmament which means expanse, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And the God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning or the second day. Interesting aspect here. This is the only day God does not say it was good. Hmm. Why is that? Okay, because destruction came. God had to cleanse the earth. And we see in Genesis chapter 7, or yes, chapter 7. Oh, let me see if I get the right spot here. But he, God repented. I don't think I wrote that down. Amen. So anyway, I'm going to go back. I'm going to, sorry for that. Um, about the ferments. In 7.11 of Genesis, he says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the earth, of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. So we see the ferments, the windows had all the waters. The waters is what was divided. Now they're coming to, together again. The waters own and the in their firmaments. It's interesting, it says the word um, windows of heaven. It's, it's an, windows is an interesting word. It means lattice. Like it was something that, that this, it was an opening um, for the deluge, the flood to come. So the lattices of heaven were open. And that's an, there's a lot of thought in that, and I didn't want to get too deep into that aspect that about people believe that the ground was watered before the flood came. It wasn't rain as we would know it today. There were, it was a watering um, up from the ground. If you read in, in, um, in Genesis, how the earth was watered, things that day. But at this point, everything burst open and the waters came and flooded the earth. 
This was in Noah's, Noah's day. Now we realize Noah was born at the beginning of this era. He died at the end of the era. Amen. And Noah lived 950 years. So he's born in 2948. He died in 1998 of that year. So really his life was the whole life of the, of the second day, 950 years of that. And he, um, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. God divided that. He made a promise. Um, I'm going to look for that. I thought I had that written down. He made a promise that he would never do this again. Yeah, verse 21 of chapter 8. He says, And the Lord smelled the sweet savor after the offering, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So it's, it's an interesting aspect that God realized wickedness, okay? 2,000 years came. You're going to find 2,000-year two, intervals. A major event happened. And the first 1,000 years is that wickedness had gotten to such a spent that the flood had to come and cleanse it from what happened. And the righteous line through Noah was the only one that made it through the floodwaters. We read about that in Peter. Okay, so it's a very interesting thing. Again, Noah died in 1998 B.C. The next happened at the beginning, or excuse me, two years later. This is very interesting. Two years after Noah died, in the year 1996 B.C., a man by the name of Abraham, or Abram, was born. So we find out, you know, there wasn't that, we think of eons between patriarchs, but really Noah died. Two years later, Abraham was born. Again, another, tradi tradi <clears throat> another um, uh, hallelujah, transition point. So we see the first was Adam to Noah. The second day was Noah to Abraham. And okay, so it's an interesting aspect, the patriarchal age. Abraham was born right around 2000 BC. All right, so we go into day three. Now this is the day... When Gary was talking, the Lord began to speak to me some very specific things that I just found fascinating. And we're going to read Genesis 1, chapter, or verses 9 and 10. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. So we find an interesting thing. That's just the first half of those times. He found dry land and called it good. All right. What did Moses happen to do? Okay. We find out, let me back up a little bit. Abraham, born right around 2000 AD. Moses, who lived from about 1571 BC to 1451 BC, right over the midway mark. I find that interesting. And in that time, we know what happened is he took a, a man, Abraham, his descendants, sent them into Egypt. They came out as a, a people. God is beginning to form something, but they came out as a people. Okay. And in that, dude, he had two crossings. First one, when they left Egypt, they crossed the, the Red Sea. And how did they cross that? So anybody want to go to, you know, I'm going to give some scriptures because I keep looking for these and it's going to slow us down. But Exodus 14, Patrick, Pat, can you get Exodus 14, 21 and 29? And Bob, Joshua 4, 22. Are we okay? Yes. Amen. Can maybe put it back to the screen, Gary? Give them an opportunity to read. Tell me that Exodus again. 14, 21, and 29. 
want me to read it? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Um, Exodus 14, 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night <clears throat> and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the Verse 29, yeah. Verse 29. Just 29? Okay. Correct. Uh, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. Amen. Dry land. They walked on dry land. God created on the third day. God created dry land. And on the 3,000th year, the people of Israel walked on dry land. I found it. To me, that was amazing. I just found that the correlation of that would happen in these days of creation, what happened in the natural world at that time. God was speaking something of uh, Joshua 4.22, Bob. Okay. Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. Amen. Further. And so the absent, when they went into the promised land, they also crossed on dry land. I think that's speaking something. And it happened halfway through. And it's interesting, on the third day, what happened? He said, and God saw that it was good. That was halfway through the third day, and he called the first half of that third day good. The dry land. It was good. It's speaking something. God created dry land out of all this happening. After the great flood, he created a, a way out. And it wasn't through a mucky area, but it was through dry land. Earth, something permanent. In, in the, there's a lot into this. But I found it very interesting that the first thing he did is he created dry land in, in a period. And I see that from Abraham to Moses. We're halfway through the third day. Now we want to go to Genesis 1, um, 11 through 13. And it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself and upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And it was evening and morning for the third day. So the second half of the day, he brought forth seed. Well, <clears throat> we went from Abraham to Moses, from basically um, 2000 BC to 1500 BC. And we're going from Moses to David, which was born in 960 BC, BC, the next thousand years. And it's interesting, the, the second of the day came forth was seed, okay? Now, Gary, would you look up 2 Samuel 22, 51? And do any of you ladies want to take that? Uh, I see Tammy and, can we put it back? Another sister there. Would you want one to bring a scripture? I need somebody to find me 18, Psalm 1850. I've got oh. Second Samuel here when you're ready. Uh, okay. 2251. You ready? Okay. Why don't you go ahead? And... Uh, it says, he is a tower of salvation for his king and soweth mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forevermore. To David and to his seed forevermore. So we see a seed was being set forth, and it was through David. And we're going to find that as we get into the fourth day, we're going to even see that even um, more so. Okay, but um, we see that seeds being established in Psalm eighteen fifty. Did anybody get that? Psalms eighteen fifty. I've got it here. Okay. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. Amen. To David and his seed. So we find the second half of the day, there's a seed, and it's being established through David. Just like in the second half of the third day, it talks about the seed, herb-bearing seeds. Life was coming through through a seed. I find that, I just found that very... Uh, interesting on the third day that dry land and seed and we find out historically over that time you had abraham 
to Moses, who crossed on dry land, Moses to David, where the seed was established. Mm. And there is two, it was good. The dry land was good, bringing forth the people, and the seed was good, bringing forth, we know, the seed of Christ. We'll get to that a little bit later. So I'm, I find it very interesting. First three days we're dealing with, we go from Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham, then oh no, Abraham to Moses to David. We see the, a progression happening with something that we went from a man to a people to setting forth a nation. Hallelujah. Day four, Genesis 1, 14 through 19. Hallelujah. And I tell you, um, see, Betty, you read, was that you that read before? Yes. Hey, Jim, do you want to find Romans 1, 3? So I'm, as I read Genesis chapter 1, 14 through 19. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God said, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give them light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So we see the fourth day is going from 1000 BC to Christ, AD, 0 AD or whatever, right? Or, you know, and they believe he's been anywhere from 2 to 4 BC was when Jesus was born. But we find out that this time where things are developed, light is established, um, the sun and the moon, signs, seasons, days, and years. And I'd like to go ahead and read your uh, Jim, why don't you read your scripture out of Romans 1? Romans 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Okay. So we see the purpose of the seed of David was to bring forth the Christ. And Romans 1, 3 establishes that without a doubt. So we find out the next thing, the next thousand years goes from David to Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's also established at this point, David, the one thing David has up to a point, we talked about Israel all that time, but until David was not, all of Israel is not taken. Okay. Up until that point, there was a spot. It was, and it was, we know it as Mount Zion. It's where the Jebusites lived. They lived in that land for almost 500 years in that top of Mount Zion, the most hope, best place ever that was to do it, was still not taken by the people of Israel. But David took it. And it was so important to David. It was the very first thing that he did when he became king over all of Israel. Mm. Who will go up, he says. Who will go up. How important is that, that, that completeness? You know, you look at a president, the very first thing a president does in office is the most important thing that he had, you know, that he said he was going to do if elected. Okay. David announced that back when he slew Goliath's head, there's slew Goliath. He took his head. What did he do with his head? He took his head and he took it and he threw it down at the gates of Jerusalem. Hmm. All those years early, earlier, he was telling them that I'm going to come for you. Jebusites. I slew this giant, and I'm going to sl slay you because they were saying our weak and our lame can defend this place because they had the high place. But David was going on. So David is the one that brought Israel fully in possession of the land. Okay, and I believe that's why at that point is when the thousand years began. And then it goes from David to the Christ. Okay, and it's also at that time the second clock was started, and that was the clock of Israel. Okay, everything that happened in that nation was pointing to bring forth the clock. The blind line was established. Okay, and we know 
how important the bloodline was. They even did, they had a diversion where they took the name. It's interesting. After Solomon's son, um, Rehoboam, came down and he abused the people. They they split. Okay, the northern kingdom took the name, but the southern kingdom took the bloodline. And I find that very interesting. Even today, a lot of people have the name of Christ, but they do not live in the bloodline of Christ. Mm. It's more important to be the bloodline. If you ever study all the kings, not one king in the northern kingdom was said, he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It's so important to be part of the bloodline. And that's what is established here. And a clock was set in motion, the second clock. And that was Israel as a nation. Mm. Amen. Any questions or anything? Should we continue? Amen. It's good. Amen. Day five. Now we're going to get kind of interesting what's happening. And we're going to start with day five. I'm going to read Genesis chapter one, 20 to 23. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly and the moving creatures that have life and falls and may fly above the earth in the open firmaments of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let falls multiply in the earth. In the evening, in the morning, were the fifth day. You're going to find out these last two days. Now, let me back up a moment. We talked about the first 2,000 years. It went from Adam to the flood, destruction. A cataclysmic event happened. The next 2,000 years, we went from Abraham to Christ, okay, going through Moses and David and all that to Christ. Another cataclysmic class, event happened, and that was the death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, it changed the world, as we know. So now we're interesting at that point. We're seeing it at this point, the first thousand years after. Now these, are, these chapters here, or these verses here, days five and six, have a very unique aspect of it. And they both have the same commission. That commission is to be fruitful and multiply. Hmm. That's what the gospel is about. Hallelujah. Um, Mark, Russell, can you look up Mark 16, 20? And uh, let's see. Does Tammy or Tara want a, a scripture? Yes, I can do a scripture. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Acts 2, verses 41 and 47. Are you ready for Russ? Russ, yeah. You'll have to unmute, Russ. Okay, I'm going to pretend to be Russ. Matthew, All right. Mark 16, 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Amen. They didn't get the one. <laughs> Great. They went forth and... and uh, amen. Preach the gospel. Be fruitful and multiply. Same phone. Okay, Acts 2. Uh, Sister Tammy. What verse? 41 and 47. Okay. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about the thousand souls. 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. So we see that be fruitful and multiply. The gospel went forth. Many were added. And actually, that same thing comes down to us today. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, hallelujah. So we see the first thousand years it's kind of interesting we know a lot of them that we call the dark ages a lot of things happen in that time but this is the time that christ was established in the church christ in the church the beautiful thing about all this we know that 
throughout this time, there was always a remnant. Yes. We, you know, the most church history talks about the ecclesiastical side of it. What happened was mostly normed through certain churches, but certain books like Torch of the Testimony by John W. Kennedy and um, E.H. Broadbent's book, uh, The Pilgrim Church, talk about the remnants, the Bogomils, the Waldensians, uh, many others that had gone before for many years that lived outside of the church realm, but they kept the gospel and kept it pure. Um, I got a chart here. Um, I don't know if you can see it at much. It, it describes on that, but it's interesting. This is kind of like the mainland churches that we know the history of, but under here is all those that we don't know the history of. And um, it's a very interesting chart. It probably doesn't do it justice, but it talks about all those, um, the hidden Christians, <laughs> if you want to say, those that weren't out there for glamour or for, for things, but they they were true to the word of God. Um, like I said, Montanists, Cathars, um, Waldensians, Abigenians, Cathars, uh, like I said, Bogomils, and then people such as John Wycliffe, and that came out of the John Huss, that came out of it, that had a word. But in the first thousand years, there was these people that kept it. Christ was in the church. And it's important, important that we see Christ being brought forth in the church and keeping the purity of the word, being fruitful and multiplying. And one of the aspects of the church, and I've said this before, is that persecution has always been a fertile ground for the growth of the church. Mm. We talked about Diocletius a few years ago few uh, meetings ago in around 300 where he had the most uh, the worst persecution of the church ever recorded in history where he destroyed every church burnt every bible killed every leader and yet after his three-year reign of terror there were more christians on the earth than when he began we can hear that throughout their these churches the church is bathed in the bloods of the martyrs. We, You ever read books like Martyr's Mirror, you know, um, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. So I want you to realize, even in today's age, when people come against the church, it is the blood of the martyrs that brings life to the church. So be encouraged in that. We find that Christ will not, the life of Christ will never be removed off the face of the earth. 1966, in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, Mao, um, Mao, where was that? No. Um, yeah. Mao declared that the church was dead. He had wiped it out. He said, would never, would never rise again with a words of Mao. Today, the greatest revival in the world is happening in China. Oh, there, there was a man, I, I saw this placard, this guy was dancing around, and he said, um, if Christ comes again, we'll kill him and dance on his grave. And I chuckled and I thought to myself, well, he ain't there. He isn't in the grave. He has risen again. And just like in that hour, Christ rose from the dead. You cannot kill God because he resurrected and he will live forever in the hearts of men. And no matter what man does to the church, it's going to grow. It's going to be fruitful and multiply and have that assurance. Amen. No matter how hard or how bad it may look. Amen. You're talking about a great revival at the end of the time. That to me tells me there's going to be a great persecution because to have a great revival, it has to come out of a great persecution. Mm -hmm. So don't be discouraged, brethren, but know the blood of the saints fuels the multiplication, the glory of God. The persecution in Jerusalem spread the gospel out to the corners of the world where they thought they were trying to kill it. All they did was expand it. And you hear these stories, you draw, read Fox's Book of Martyr, read Martyr's Mirror. These wonderful stories of those that have gone before that have laid their life down. The life of John Huss, John Whitecliffe, many that have laid down their lives. Anyway, I can get on a soapbox here, but the church in Christ. The first thousand years, as much as on in the ecclesiastics and man trying to put his hands on religion and, and make religion, God was still pertinent in the lives of men and women on the earth and they were fruitful and they multiplied all right that's the first thousand years second thousand years genesis one or i shouldn't say the you know day six one thousand to two thousand a.d now we're getting current here 
And it says, Oh, yeah. Verse 26. What chapter? Chapter 1, Genesis. Okay. I, I believe, let me see. Yeah. God said, let us, excuse me, verse 24, forgive me. You need to start verse 24 and 25. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, the cattle and creeping things, and the beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. This is the second day, the sixth day, the second time a twofold goodness happened. Amen. First goodness that it was in the, the earth bringing forth. And that's kind of interesting. We know earth stands for man. And the earth was bringing forth its creatures. In that we find out that this is when... You, they started to be a lot of um, how do you a rebellion against the man-made um, aspects of religion. The Great Schism that divided the East Church from the Western Church happened in 1056. Then again, men like I mentioned earlier, Wycliffe, Jerome of Prague, John Huss, in the early um, they were from the 12th to the 14th century, 15th century. These men laid down their lives but were revolutionary in what they had to say and began to speak of. These are the men that inspired a man named Martin Luther, a man who we're all, we're all familiar with. It. We've all called the father of the Reformation. But these are the men that he heard and read that inspired him to do that. Again, the blood of, of the saints was making fertile the fields of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so they find that, again, the first half of the year, there was a preparation of the land. Yeah, again, in fruit and multiply. In the second half, Genesis 1, 26 to 31. And God said, let us make man. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the likeness of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a <clears throat> fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth to every fowl of the air to everything that creepeth upon the earth when there is life i have given every green herb for meat and it was so and god saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day wow praise god God set forth something. He made a plan and a man, as we read that dominion of that. So we see the second half of the sixth day, raising around 1500 Martin Luther to today. God is establishing something. The just shall live by faith. He's re revolutionized the whole aspect of what Christianity is about. Hallelujah. And there's been a, 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 a burgeoning of it. And I call this era the time from Christ. Remember, the first thousand years was Christ in the church. The second thousand years is the church in Christ. Now we're seeing that not only the church working, but we're getting into it, that getting into Christ, that's finding its, its full life in Christ. It's, his, it's their creator. We always say, um, it says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. But later on in that uh, Colossians in chapter 3, it says, you in Christ is the glory. And that's what God's bringing us. He's putting the church in Christ. And, and then the promises, when he talked about dominion of that, that is what we call sonship. So the end of the 2,000 years, this, you know, day six, is to bring forth a people that will be the sons of God. The church in Christ walking in the calling, the election, 
and everything that God has called us to be. He is bringing forth the people in this hour, and we are blessed to be in this hour, to be known as the sons of God, to walk in sonship. This whole six oh, yeah. days went from the beginning where light was created and was good to the light being in the people that are called by his name. Hallelujah. A group that we call the sons of God. The Elijah Company, there's many words, many names that we can give it. I just sum it up in the word sonship. Mm -hmm. Now, brethren, are we the sons of God? And this does not yet appear what we should be. But this we know, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That is what God is doing. Be fruitful and multiply. Purification, that's what God is calling us in this hour. Even as Noah in his day was perfect in the calling that he had to build an ark, God is calling us today to be ye perfect, even as he as our Heavenly Father is perfect, mm -hmm. to fulfill the calling of sonship in our lives. Say, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Let Christ come forth, be fruitful, multiply. Uh, there is nothing that the gates of hell cannot stand against Man. the people of God. Amen. So the 6,000 years, and we're going to get into day seven, but we see these 6,000 years all led up to one thing, a people, a nation, Yes. God's a generation, hallelujah, they will walk in it. But they without us are not made perfect, and we without them are not made perfect. All those that have gone before these, all these great men and women of God throughout the generations are waiting for this day. Paul said, I wish to be in that day. Joseph saw that day. Yes. Noah saw that day. They all saw that day. David saw that day and wanted to be part of that. We read in Revelations, they're crying out from the altar underneath the souls in the earth for that day. And he said, be wait until the final brethren will be slain for the kingdom message that we all rejoice. And that's, that's another whole teaching. But I'm going to finish this up here. We're going to talk about day seven, the day to come. Amen. And then we'll, and I'll open up to any questions, comments, or anything that somebody has. So. Let's go back to Genesis, but we'll start with chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Hallelujah. After six days, it was finished. The work was going to be done at this day, at this time, for we at the end of the sixth day, brethren. The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work when he which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Amen. All his work. Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. Now let us turn in to Revelations. Chapter 20. We're at the beginning of the book. We're going to the end of the book. Russ, I'm going to give you a Would you please read Revelations chapter 20, verse 6? Oh, okay. He's on the phone with his brother oh. on this. Oh, okay. So I'm going to pretend to be Russ again. Will you, Gary? Thank you. Yeah. So <laughs> this is Russ. Revelations 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. You want to know this next seventh, seventh day? That's what's going to happen. We find it interesting. Genesis 2, verse 3 actually says, blessed and sanctified. Here it says, blessed and holy. What does holy mean? Sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Holy. Set aside. It's the same people, brethren. Hmm. He set that down. He called, but instead of calling that day, he called those people. 
Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power. And they shall be priests in the God of you know, Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. What did we read at the end of the day six? What he was preparing us to have rulers to rule over his creation. Amen. So we see the story of Genesis, the first seven days, or actually the first six days with the completion of the seventh. First six days, God made a people, a plan, and that was the ruling reign with him for a thousand years. What a glorious day. Seven days that changed the world, that made the world. Amen. Thanks for your time. Questions? Okay, uh, I just have to have a question. So um, these six days don't don't only describe creation; they describe the next six thousand years. I mean, you you are this the whole Bible fits in these six days. I mean, these yes. six thousand years. That's what you're saying, and. The people that, well, hopefully, were the people that uh, God was creating. Um, is that what you're saying? Is that we're we're here now at the end of the sixth day? Yes. Well, I quoted yes, and you know I should have used this scripture, and I I I, I did not do this, but I'm going to give you a scripture that confirms what you're saying. In Second Peter three, it says, verse eight. But, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Amen. So that's why I get the correlation of a thousand years per day. I believe, yes, it's been 6,000 years um, from the day of Adam. And each day of creation was... I. I would be the word to say was mirrored or was was reality was was what happened in that thousand years of life and to build up to this day to a people each day god was developing a plan a clock and actually the third clock and anything you can talk that is the clock of the of the sons of god for the millennial age setting forth that there is a clock ticking even as we speak, to bring forth a people. And I believe that clock is near the midnight hour, the time that it's going to sound. And we will usher in that thousand years of the seventh day. Amen. Does that answer your question or not? Yeah. Yeah, he's just writing. So, Amen. so, um, when you heard about this, and or when you think what's what happened in your head when this whole thing went, oh, I mean nobody else has ever taught this, you know that we're in that timeline. Of course, I missed uh, this on Gary's talk. So is this on your talk? This uh, right. I'm sorry. Yes. This was Gary's. Uh, yeah. Did you talk about this or was this Gary's? See, I must have missed this because I don't remember this. This page. Well, in in my talk, I referenced this line right here that just said day one, day two, day three, and I said that we need to pick up on that and study that further. But my focus was on the church ages and oh. how that related to the tabernacle. I remember now. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's what a correlation. Yeah. Yeah. And it, go ahead. Yeah. It, I mean, this is something that um, goes back 30, 40 years for me, but it, it blew my mind. It, it just really, you know, that's a, maybe not a good expression, but I mean, when, when I begin to see these correlations and it was actually, my goodness, before we were married. So that's 45, 44 years ago, probably. Uh, it was these correlations of these things, these particularly the threes in scripture, that 
really cemented something within the heart of my heart. And I, I, I knew this was truth and I knew we were on the right track. And I, it just so made it so positive and so real for me. Yeah. And uh, it, it is just super exciting, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> praise God. And, and the thing about it is we're right at the end of this sixth day, Patrick, Pat, and entering this final day of the Lord, this day of rest, this kingdom. And it's glorious. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. And he is going to finally create a perfect man in the earth. And it's going to be a corporate people that are, are not going to fall, are not going to uh, make a mistake and detour. But where, they, where Adam went from life to death, this people is going to go from death to life and there will be no turning back. And, you know, we see all the trouble in the world and there is no solution outside of Christ coming forth in this people. There is no political solution. There is no economic solution. There is no religious solution. And there's going to be groups of people that are going to, attempt to bring resolution on all of these levels and bring all of these aspects together in a human sense. But they're, they're going to have some seemingly success for a period of time, but there's going to be a remnant of people that are going to enter into this fullness and are going to explode on the scene and God is going to use them in a mighty way to put down everything that is antichrist, everything that is against God, everything that is not God, everything that is lukewarm, everything that is part God. So praise, praise God. It's, it's wonderful. It's glorious. Amen. Amen. That is truly amazing. Yep. Any other questions or thoughts, Bob, Jim, J Betty, Tara, Tammy, Ben Ansa? Hallelujah. Any other input, questions? Praise God. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's wonderful because I believe that the, you know, it brings such a reality to the story of the creation that it wasn't just, you know, God decided to do this thing on this day, God decided to do another thing on another day, but it was God Almighty at the very inception of time when God said, you know, let there be light, and he began time right there he, he had the whole 7,000 years planned out Amen. and he also had the he had his son dying on the cross planned out mm. and it was all there before he said let there be light and it brings such a an important reality and I, I guess the main point I want to say is God prophesied when he began to bring these things forth day by day. And, you know, it's, it's right there. It's in plain view. And it's for those that are like the Bereans and will search it out, but it brings such a, a confirmation and a witness to us of what is God's plan. And it, it, it's just laid out perfectly. It's laid out beautifully. And praise God, praise God. You know, I mean, uh, Noah here, we'll bring up this slide again here real quick. Yeah, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer? Maybe not? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Adam, 
Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Matthew, Paul, and all of these men throughout the Word of God would have given anything to live in our day today. To see the finale, the final act of God, this 6,000 years that's been happening, all leading up to this culmination right now. I mean, you just, you, you want to jump out of your skin. It is so exciting. And I'd give anything to have one of them live today. Praise God. They would, they would love to be a part of it. But Hebrews 11 and 12 speak of that, that they died in faith, not having received the promise, the promise that we are speaking of tonight, this promise of this final transformation within a people, this sonship coming forth within a people. But they all died in faith, not having received the promise, but they without us shall not be made perfect. They will not be robbed. They died in faith, believing and understanding and contending for this. And somehow God is going to join them with us in this final day, in this final time, in this final act of resurrection life coming forth in its fullness. Praise God. Praise God. Let us be faithful. Let us dedicate ourselves. Let us put aside every weight. Let us focus on this. There is nothing greater in all of history than this. You know, you can think of man landing on the moon or, you know, whatever else happened throughout history. This is the greatest time in history. It's Amen. wonderful. It's fantastic. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, praise the Lord. Anyone else? Any other final thoughts here? Hallelujah. Amen. Gary, I'm going to look. I got some scriptures here um, to find just to support what you were just saying. Um, and I kind of referred to it earlier. Um, <clears throat> let me find the other scriptures. So I have it all together here. In Revelations chapter 6, this is uh, <clears throat> verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, now this is the altar of incense, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servant, also their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So it's an interesting. God has a fullness of people. You know what I mean? And they're all waiting. They're crying out, how much longer? Yeah. But I want you to, in, in chapter 19, Amen. Verse 1, it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great horror which did corrupt the earth with her fornications and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And that's when it's happening. And they're going to be rejoicing in heaven. Hallelujah. Giving glory and honor, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Hallelujah. It's a great voice of many people. God is doing that. We are all one. They without us, we without them. They laid it on. If it wasn't Noah being perfect in his generation, we would not have made it. Without David being perfect in his generation, we would not have made it. With each of these men and women, that have set forth, Deborah, the things that you were called to do, they fulfilled what God had. Did they make mistakes? Yes, they made mistakes. 
But God doesn't judge us on our mistakes. He judges us fulfilling the calling that God has that he's put on our life. Not doesn't wink at our mistakes. David paid greatly for these things, but he repented and turned back unto the Lord. Each generation it wasn't for John Huss. It wasn't for, you know, Madame Guyon. I don't know if you've read the stories of Madame Guyon. The stand that the influence she had on people. We don't know all that in there, but all these people, because they were faithful mm-hmm. in their generation, served it to what God had called them to be, are we standing here today? Amen. Amen. And we want to be faithful that we would stand with them in that day. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? Any final thought before we conclude and close in prayer here today? Ben, do you have anything? Put you on the spot, brother. Oh, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> no, um, um, it was very interesting because um, I didn't see the creation this way in the past. But, um, you know, I just believe God will give us uh, more understanding. At least you've given us something to chew on. So my prayer is that um, we will, you know, go home, meditate on these things and um, get better understanding. And hopefully if we have more questions, we can bring them at a later date. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, as we, you know, we there's a lot that has been brought here but it's, you know, a lot of new thoughts and there's a lot more study as we go into it individually. I think the Lord can elaborate and bring further understanding and further truths. Uh, even though it's been very comprehensive tonight, in some regard, we have only scratched the surface. And, you know, these aspects of creation and its correlation to these 7,000 years and all of the ages in, you know, throughout history, uh, it's throughout the Bible, throughout the word of God. And uh, as we, you know, in the future study other things and other topics, I think things will jump out at us that refer back to this study and what we've heard tonight and further confirming uh, these thoughts and what God has really prophesied here. So praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, amen. Amen. Um, Maybe Bob or Russ or somebody could close us in prayer today. Hallelujah. Holy Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the understanding you have uh, further opened up for us. Uh, And as we've discussed, Lord, we pray you add to it and uh, confirm it more and more from different aspects of your word. Thank you for the length and breadth and depth and height that is in your word. Uh, There's so much, uh, there's so much yet to be understood and walk in lord help us to really walk in and execute your word yes. hallelujah so uh, bless tom for his contri- contribution tonight father let everyone be blessed in their sleep and their rest protect us from the evil one mm. we pray these things in jesus name amen mm. amen amen praise god uh i'll just say while i couldn't pick up the phone up uh, i'm unmute because my brother had called me and he they have another liver for him oh praise the lord he said it's good chance early tomorrow morning they'll be operating amen well we will keep him in prayer yes let him know that we stand with him and we praying with him amen Amen. great praise god amen well good night to everybody thank you for staying with us here blessings to all And uh, it's Wednesday night. We hope to see you all on Sunday, uh, 2.30 Eastern Time, 1.30 Central Time. Last Sunday, we didn't have one because of the conference going on through the Atlanta Brethren there. Many of us attended that conference through Zoom. 
uh, and it was a great, great conference, praise God. But uh, we are resuming on Zoom here and on Sunday. We hope to see you, and you're all, again, welcome on our Saturday prayer call. That's at 9 o'clock Central Time, and uh, that's on a telephone conference, so you have to dial into that. And if anybody needs the phone number, uh, just let me know somehow. Text, email, call, smoke signals, whatever <laughs> works for you. So praise God. Well, blessings to all. Keep these brethren Bless. that we prayed for uh, yeah. earlier in yeah. prayer. Uh, Carolyn Trotter there, and uh, of course, Brother Dwayne uh, here in the morning looks like be getting uh, major surgery there, a new liver. And keep David in prayer and Glenn as they begin to drive probably in the morning. So praise God. Hallelujah. Blessings to all. Have a good evening. Good night's rest. Okay. Amen. Good night. Good night. Good night.